So I'm Brian Jacob from data.world. Uh, what I'm not gonna talk about are any kind of specific use cases where we're working with customers who are building topical knowledge graphs. I'm not gonna talk about the techniques we use to automate knowledge extraction. There's been a ton of great talks on those topics. I'm gonna talk about something a little bit further afield from that, which is how we approach Building a, building a platform, building out a knowledge graph based platform for organizations that maybe aren't yet ready to think about knowledge graphs. So I hope that there's a lot of useful ideas that you can take in here, whether you're building or buying a knowledge graph based solution that can maybe help you get started and overcome some of that resistance that Dean was talking about in his talk. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some of the theories that we have that we've kind of used to develop our, our principles around how we build our platform. The methodology that we use to develop that platform a little bit about the platform itself, kind of a quick preview of, of, of making some of those ideas I'm gonna talk about more real. And then I'm gonna go through three use cases of customers that I specifically picked because they are not thinking of us as a knowledge graph platform. They don't really think of us in that way at all. So some of these series are gonna be, you know, very much, very, very much in line with things you've heard, you've heard here today and hopefully not too controversial, right? We think about a knowledge graph fundamentally as representing everything an organization knows about a subject. We think that a knowledge graph is the only real way to deal with the complexity of enter enterprise data at scale, and that at some point in scale, everyone is going to need to think about something that's isomorphic to this architecture. Today, right now, the knowledge that an, that an organization has is in its people's heads, it's in silos, it's written down in wikis. The, po the point is not that there is no knowledge about what, about what, the, what the company knows, but that it's not pulled together in a coherent way. And so corollaries off of that are that knowledge resides where people are actually working with data throughout an organization. And that a knowledge graph then is really what happens when you take all of that knowledge and make it coherent, turn it into an actual asset that you can leverage to, to, to uh, achieve your goals. And organizations have goals around data management that are based on business value. They wanna make better decisions. They wanna effectively use their data. They wanna break down those silos, consolidate knowledge, make their data more actionable, more coherent, more usable. Nowhere in there is I want to have a knowledge graph for a knowledge graph's sake. But again, we fundamentally believe, and I think you've heard this a lot here, that the only architecture that's really gonna achieve that at scale is thinking about things as a knowledge graph. And the same kind of pillars we've heard a few other people talk about. You need a graph model that focuses on relationships, you need ontologies and semantics to bring meaning into it, you, want, you, you need inferencing and machine learning, and then this leads to kind of better outcomes in, in AI where you can do explainable AI and, and model checking and, and, and those, those sorts of things. Uh, Josh kind of stole my thunder on this, but it's a great analogy, so I'm gonna keep it in here because it's in my slides. If you think about this as you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if you think about that pinnacle as being this fully materialized, fully articulated, completely, co completely semantically aware knowledge graph that knows everything your organization needs, he pointed at the middle of the graph is where he thinks a lot of folks, a lot of folks, and maybe I think it was referring to Uber itself, I, I would say that the vast majority of organizations are way closer to the bottom of this, this pyramid. They're actually at the food and shelter, safety and security. And even if you completely sell them on the vision, that vision is a giant mountain to climb after they cross an ocean. Most organizations are struggling to capture knowledge and make it coherent at the most basic levels. And so if you kind of go to most organizations where, where they're thinking about these concepts is in things like data catalogs, business glossaries, solutions for, for governance and provenance. This is, these, these are the kinds of point solutions that folks are actually in the market and looking for. And our hypothesis around this is, if you had a knowledge graph, you would build these applications on top of that. And that the, thing, the data that you, would put, you put into these solutions belongs in your knowledge graph. You know, David said yesterday, talking about, you wanna move, you wanna move from columns to concepts. Absolutely, that's the end goal of all this. But right now, today, those columns exist. They are real world entities. They are, they are in tables, those, those are in databases. Those are actually valid objects to talk about and to reason about and to help guide people to. Those link to concepts that are defined in, in, in business glossaries and, those, and, and it's through understanding what those things mean, how they relate to the data that you start to iter iterate and, build, and, and build, ontological, uh, build ontologies and actually build an ontological solution. So, I'm suffering the same thing everyone else is around the small lines not showing up very well. This is a flywheel. And the, and the, the, visual, the, the visual here is that you know, we, we think that you can actually get a, a, a nice flywheel of, of motion going on here, where if you think about working with data, work with data is what actually generates knowledge. And 
making that knowledge coherent is, is exactly the same thing as building a, knowledge, is building a knowledge graph. And coherent knowledge makes it easier to work with data. If you can get these things, these things working in concert, you can get a virtuous, a virtuous cycle going where the act of people working with data, doing analytical work, understanding it, is generating knowledge which you can make coherent, which makes it easier to work with data, which, expand, which expands the footprint of people who are meaningfully working with data and contributing back to the things that generate that knowledge. The first pass of an ontology when you, when, for any organization is, gonna, is, is around the data assets themselves. What are the databases, tables, and columns? What are the business terms and, and glossaries and taxonomies and ontologies if they already exist? But also the people themselves, the work that they're doing, the queries they're writing, the conversations they're having with one another, the, the analytical artifacts, all of these things are pieces, uh, are, are, are knowledge that you can capture and curate into, into, a, into a knowledge graph. And it's important to work in the tools and paradigms that people are used to today. If, you're, if your approach to bringing a knowledge graph solution into a company is, we're gonna immediately replace the need to ever use Excel again, we're gonna immediately replace the need to use, to use Tableau, to use any, any of those tools, you're, you're, you're not gonna be able to, to get all of the people that you, you, you need to use it. What you want to build is something that is, a, is a power, a, an empowering exoskeleton that gives them new capabilities that enhance the work they're already doing, not, not replacing the existing tools and paradigms. And if you take that approach of putting the user at the center of this, you can, you can build a platform that uses the power of knowledge graphs, everything else we've been talking about today, uh, th these last two days, to give people new capabilities, to give people the better understanding of, what, of, of what, they, what knowledge exists, what data exists, what they can work with. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the methodologies that we use. So full conviction that a knowledge graph is the architecture on which we, we, want, to, we want to build our, our, our platform. Uh, but also full conviction that user-centered design, real like human-centered design, design work is just as important, really understanding what are the aspects of a platform that make it something that people will use, not just because somebody two levels up bought a platform and told me I have to use this as part of my job, but that actually adds value from the, fir from the first time you touch it. Uh, we've spent you know, a huge amount of time doing, <coughs> doing a lot of user testing, reaching out to folks who are using the open side of our community and bringing them in and sitting them down with paper prototypes, whiteboard prototypes, real world clicking prototypes, and then eventually actual features in the product themselves. But really watching people use our product, use ideas, use existing products that are out there and just analyzing their behavior. What are the aspects of how they behave that, that really kind of quantifies what that, what that data work looks like? Um, even with that, we had, a, we had a huge challenge. As you might imagine, a bunch of semantic web engineers and a bunch of UX designers did not have a lot of language in common for how to talk about these problems, did not have a lot of shared understanding of the work we were trying to achieve. And what we found repeatedly was that we were building really powerful capabilities that just were not able to get in the hands of users. And our designers were coming with really beautiful looking ideas that just kind of completely missed the point of everything we were trying to do. Our lead designer created what is officially my favorite meeting of all time. She put this on a number of our calendars called Vision Quest. And the idea is that we would meet bi-weekly at a group, of, a group of the deepest, nerdiest semantic web folks we have at the company and a group of these UX designers, and we would basically cut through the techno battle and try to understand what are the principles that we're actually, we're actually talking about and how do they relate to actual human interface that the average person, at, at the average person who's trying to interface with data can, can use. Um, one of the tools that she built was the words are hard lexicon. And the idea here you know, was really just to start getting a, getting a notion internally of what words do we use that make it really difficult for people to understand what we're, try what we're trying to get them to understand. And so we you know, ended up with a breakdown going from left to right from the good words. These are the things that we feel are unambiguous and are usable in, 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 when they're used in the product, in copy, they're, they're completely understandable to the maybe okay words that you can use in the right context when somebody's doing a specialized task, to the bad words, which 
if you're, if you're in a very expert-oriented interface, go ahead and use this to the extra bad never use outside these wall words, which you know, we are constantly working to try to move a few of those a little bit to the, a little bit to the left. But, but the idea is that you know, like these might be the correct word for us to use internally, but when you say ontology in most, in most contexts, you're immediately just creating a level of confusion that most, that most people can't engage with. So it's not that you're not building ontologies, it's that find a word that actually, actually explains unambiguously what you mean in that context. Um, one of the happiest things I saw is that we started seeing a lot of these Design, designs coming back uh, that, was, you know, that were really kind of deeply incorporating not just the thing that's on the screen, but also the, the graph model that's underneath it and, and, how that, and how those things are correlated. And I started seeing some of the standard semantic web tropes coming back from our design team. You know, when you start, when the first time I saw things, not strings, as like a trope that, that, that I didn't have to be the one to say, it was, it was, a, very, it was, a, very, it was a very good day. Um, one quick example of how this kind of went all the way through to a feature, to a feature in production, was we were looking at the problem of how to preview a graph file. If somebody's uploaded a file that's a, that, that, that's an RDF graph file, how do you want to how do you want to give the person their first experience with that file to understand? Is this something I want to dig deeper and 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 know more about? Um, first thing we tried was. Well, what about a thumbnail of the, of the graph? And you know, this is obviously about the least useful way that you could look at a look at a look at an overview of a file to understand if it makes if it makes any sense. So the, the design team said, okay, well, let's let let's let's actually bring in a bunch of let's bring in a number of people who look at these files every day, who are who are trying who who have this this problem of maybe I have a catalog that contains a lot of this data. What what could what what could tell me something about this? This particular file, in a quick glance, it lets me know what, what kind of data is in it. Uh, again, big big design exercise. You can see here, uh, you know, the 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 design that came, the hand driven written design that came back from the designer. A lot of annotations from me, other folks on my team. A lot of things that came in from various user interviews, and ended up with this kind of very 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 simple data set. Or, or, card overview that is used throughout our product. Anywhere where there's a piece of data that's been materialized as, a, as, a, as an RDF file that you could move around, it's got you know, basic summary stats around how many triples and entities are in it. It's got an overview of the namespaces, which turned out to be a, you know, one of the most important things to kind of give people a quick glance of what kinds of information are expressed in this file, and then pop outs for the classes and, the classes and predicates used. And then if you want to dig into the data itself, by far the, 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 the most useful thing that folks wanted to see was just syntax highlighted, syntax highlighted turtle. Again, the, the point isn't this feature. The point is that process of actually going out and working with you know, dozens, in this case, of people across this and a number of other features to really understand how do you actually get the information you need quickly. So I'm going to quickly go through a bunch of other platform features, things that, that, that we do that are basically meant to bring all of the various personas that we, that we want to service into the platform, surf, surface the information from the graph, and use their work within the platform to capture knowledge that feeds back into the knowledge graph. Um, first is, just for any data consumer, this is basically an a, a activity feed. It looks, it looks not coincidentally like you would see on, on any social networking site, but this is basically leveraging your social graph, the people that you've worked with, the people who you've con collaborated on work with, the graph of projects that you've, been, that you've participated on, the graph of data sets you've previously used to surface to you things that are likely of, of interest, new, new data, new developments, new ways people are using data that you've, previous, that you've previously worked with. A, View for subject matter experts to interact with insights and visualizations, and to have to have conversations to annotate to annotate this this information, which feeds direct, directly back into the into the graph. Um, this is you know very very muted as all the pictures have been, but ultimately this is a, a an interface for for folks to run exploratory queries against the, against the data itself, the data, a, a, a making connections either to data that's been ETL'd into the platform or that is, is virtualized, has a virtualized connection, letting them run queries in SQL or Sparkle directly against the underlying data sources to get an understanding of that data and how they, want to use, and how they might want to use it in their project. But again, giving us access to that query to, the, to, the, to how they're using the data, how they're bringing data sets together to, to feed back on the signal about what data sets are related and how. And profiling information, 
metadata, provenance data, quality, quality and lineage information projected through, throughout the platform. And then if you are a semantic web expert, if you do want to interact directly with, the, directly with the, the graph, you can drop down in at any point, directly, directly query it with, with Sparkle. Um, you, don't need to, you don't need to interface with Sparkle. Uh, throughout the, throughout, the, inter throughout the, the interface, and again, this is really hard to read, so I'm just going to click through and talk about it. Um, this, is, you know, th this is on a catalog page talking about the approval status for a catalog page being updated. Underneath the covers, this is, this is simply some provenance triples in, in the graph. You can go in and directly query these, string many of these together to understand lineage, but everywhere in the user interface where you need to show this information, it's projected as text in, in, in context. Uh, scrolling down, further down that page, all the tables and business terms that are referenced are also just represented underneath the covers as, as triples that you can go query and, and, and interface with. And because everything in the UI is things, not strings, anywhere where it's useful to bring that graph information forward and, hi and highlight it in context, we have the ability to, to do that. So, Really quick, I'm going to blast through these three use cases. And again, these are use cases I specifically chose as folks who are not looking at us as a knowledge graph solution. But listen to the words they're using, listen to the words they use to describe their problem and how they view the solution. And, and, and you start to see that these are, the, these are the same values that you can deliver with a knowledge graph. And they're getting it delivered to them with a knowledge graph, but they're really focused on the capabilities. So this was from Anthem Health. They came to us initially with this quote talking about how the health insurance industry still lags behind other industries in terms of a lot of customer, customer service uh, axes. Their challenge was they're making and increasing their in, in, in investments in ML and AI, and they're, they view that investment primarily as an investment in people, and the challenge they were seeing is that the best people have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge in their words. They're, they're, the modern data workers were, were not tolerating an archaic data, data system that was opaque, where they didn't, have, they didn't have an understanding of what data existed for their problems and how they could get at it. They, their goal was to build what they called a knowledge map. By subject area, they wanted to understand what are the tables, what are the fields, where is the data, what does it mean, what are some examples of how other people are using, have used this data. And their outcome, the way they phrased it, was that their tribal knowledge is getting curated and elevated within the platform. Their ROI was measured around balancing focus and creativity by giving their data scientists access and context around the data. Um, I'm going to skip the stats slides just because we're running low on time. Uh, case study number two was with, was with uh, Deloitte. And their, their challenge was within their practice areas, they were struggling to keep up with the rapid proliferation of data. They, they were not able to focus on maximizing value, using it to create insights and improve outcomes. And their goal was stated as building a data catalog. They wanted to move from their siloed data to 360 views. They wanted to in, increase the, the transparency and trust of their data and move toward, move toward a data-driven organization. Their outcome was to facilitate the reuse of data sets within a practice area. So they're not reacquiring the same data sets multiple times. So the context of what the data, what the data exists and what it means and how it's been used previously is retained. Um, and the third case study was with Miram, which is a digital agency part of the WPP group of, group of agencies. Their challenge was a little different. They're working with a lot of clients and their, their data is, sorry, their data is in spreadsheets. It's getting sent to them. It's getting sitting, sitting unversioned on, on desktops. It's, it's moving around emails. And they say spreadsheets, a lot of these were actually very, very large CSV files, kind of continuous feeds that are coming in over email and basically unmanaged. They're, they wanted to build a data-focused community to showcase their thought leadership and really highlight their value to their customers. And what they describe their outcome is basically a data-driven delivery capability, where they, they have mature data capabilities that fill gaps and are a significant step forward for their clients with ML and AI. This one I do want to pause on, because what I was really happiest about with this is this is a case where, really, without any guidance from us, one of their engineers picked up our APIs, built four bespoke applications that were sitting on top of that knowledge graph, directly interfacing with both our Sparkle endpoints and our other data management APIs to build custom apps. And they've built a library of 16 vendor agnostic data-driven use cases that they now reu reuse project to project. So from one engagement to the next, they're able to basically take the ontology that they've built without really thinking about calling it that and apply it to the next project with that client's data and, and reuse a lot of the same work.
And that's my time. Thank you.